ever got out of a Volkswagen Golf feeling that you could do with a bit more space? The answer is right here in the chiselled form of the Golf SV. Here the Wolfsburg brand has brought us a proper purpose-built family-sized five-seat MPV that offers key advantages to justify its premium over the standard hatchback model. It's Volkswagen's idea of what a Scenic or a C-Max should really be. And if you're buying in this segment and want something a little nicer, you could find it hard to resist, particularly in this smarter, more sophisticated revised form. Every year around a million people worldwide buy some sort of variant of the Volkswagen Golf. Most choose the hatch or estate versions, of course, but a few need something that's golf sized with golf values that's just that bit more versatile. This model, the Golf SV, it was originally launched in 2014, but we're looking here at the much improved version that Volkswagen brought us for the 2018 model year. The SV moniker stands for Sports Van, a name used for this car in Europe, but one the importers here understandably didn't much like, hence its shortening to a couple of simple letters for our market. True, some more utilitarian MPVs are a little more than refurbished vans, uh, Volkswagen's own Caddy Life model, for example. This one, though, is a long way from being an LCV, but by the same token, it also sits some distance from sportiness. What buyers do get, though, is a five-seat compact MPV and the Scenic or C-Max mould that borrows from its conventional Golf stablemate but doesn't have to sit on that car's restricted wheelbase. Now that's in contrast to this model's predecessor, the Golf Plus, which was hobbled in its aspirations for exactly that reason and which never sold well here as a result. Mind you, the Golf SV has never sold particularly well here either. Volkswagen sells twice as many Golf Estates as SVs, and the Golf Hatch outsells this MPV 25 to 1, which actually doesn't make much sense given that what you're getting here is quite a lot of extra practicality, but not much more money than any ordinary Golf would cost you. On the continent, they recognise that much more clearly. Uh, when it comes to this car, the German market, for example, outsells us 10 to 1. To be fair, the sales niche here is an admittedly narrow one. If a standard Golf hatch isn't versatile enough, but you still want something pretty compact, then the Volkswagen brand can alternatively sell you their straightforward Golf Estate, their seven-seater Touran small people mover, or the van derived Caddy Life MPV we mentioned earlier. None of these cars, though, have the dynamic style, the flair, and the driveway cred, which is necessary for widespread acceptance in the C-Neck and C-Max class. In contrast, the Golf S SV has always claimed to offer exactly that. It is still not the largest car of its kind, but it does claim to be the classiest, something emphasised by the round of updates that we're going to check out here with this revised model. This features a, a rejuvenated engine range, smarter looks, an upgraded cabin and improvements to both safety and media connectivity. Will it all be enough to attract a little more attention from buyers in this country? Let's put this car to the test. Surely this car can't handle exactly like the Golf hatch it's based on. After all, it's got about 80 mils more length and width, 120 millimeters more height, and it's about 120 kilos heavier. You'd have to notice that around the corners, wouldn't you? Surely. Well, really, though, you don't. Uh, now, we're not saying that there's no difference at all. Uh, you do get a touch more body roll through tighter turns, but in truth, it really isn't terribly significant. Or perhaps it's that your mind's distracted from the issue by the surprisingly sharp way that this SV turns into the twisty stuff. Now, some of the credit for that goes to the standard XDS electronic differential lock that automatically breaks the inner wheel through each tight curve just before it loses traction, and that sharpens turning and fires you from bend to bend. The rival Ford C-Max uses a similar system, and overall that does remain a slightly more rewarding steer, although so that's only really because it comes with a more feelsome electric steering setup. If it wasn't for that, uh, the dynamic differences between these two MPVs wouldn't actually be that great. 
The key change with this revised Golf SV lies beneath the bonnet, where the entire petrol engine lineup is different to the one that we saw when this car was first launched. Uh, that old 1.2 litre TSI unit has given way to the Volkswagen Group's now familiar three cylinder 1 litre TSI engine. That's offered in 85 and 110 PS guises. Uh, your alternative petrol option is the 1.5 litre TSI EV unit that we're trying here. And that replaces the old 1.4 litre TSI variant and it's mainly offered with 130 PS, although you can have a 150 PS version at the top of the range. The TDI diesel selections on offer are more familiar, a 1.6 TDI at the bottom of the range with 115 PS and a 2 litre TDI 150 PS power plant at the other end of the lineup. As for transmission choice, well the base 1 litre TSI 85 PS petrol model comes only with manual transmission while both the top 150 PS 2 litre TDI and 1.5 litre TSI Evo variants only come with DSG 7 speed auto gearboxes. Are the variants in between? Those are the ones that almost everyone will buy offer either manual or auto alternatives. Uh, we're trying the auto version here. You'll need a decent level of performance to push a fully laden Golf SV along and to be frank the entry level uh, 1 litre TSI 85 PS variant can't provide it. 62 miles an hour from rest in that derivative occupies 13 seconds even if you try to be quick with that variant's 5 speed stick shifter. But of more significance is the fact that this base model has just 175 newton metres of torque with which to propel uh, nearly 1.4 tonnes of MPV. The alternative entry level units, the 1 litre TSI 110 PS petrol and the 1.6 litre TDI 115 PS diesel are both much better, uh, both endowed with a bit more pulling power which gets them to 62 mph in around 11 seconds on route to 119 miles an hour. It is worth mentioning though that all these base engine variants are slightly hobbled dynamically uh, by the fact that they have to be paired up with the brand's cruder old tech torsion beam suspension setup and that can give you a bit of a fidgety ride at low speeds over poorer surfaces. To avoid this and get a proper modern multi-link setup like the one you'll find right across the range in say a rival Ford C-Max, you have to stretch to a 1.5 litre petrol or 2 litre diesel Golf SV variant. Now we certainly recommend the 130 PS 1.5 litre TSI Evo petrol unit that we've selected for this test. It's smooth, frugal and it offers as much performance as likely owners will need. Uh, 62 miles an hour occupies 9.6 seconds on the way to 100. 26 miles an hour. The 150 PS version of this unit improves those stats to 8.8 .8 seconds and 132 miles an hour. For sheer pulling power though, uh, your variant of choice in the lineup will be the 2 litre TDI diesel. Now this makes 62 miles an hour in 9.2 seconds on the way to 130 miles an hour, but more importantly it puts out much more torque than the petrol units, 340 newton metres, and that will give you a 1.6 tonne brake towing capacity total. The other advantage of uh, choosing a Golf SV with 1.5 litre petrol or 2 litre diesel power is that you get the option to equip your car with the extra cost DCC, Dynamic Chassis Control System. Now, that's a setup that in our experience is quite effective at dealing with that touch of cornering body roll that we mentioned at the beginning. DCC offers specifically tuned sport and comfort options and that depends on how you want to drive and those are modes you'll select from the driving mode selection system system that you'll find on all but the most basically trimmed versions of this car. Now without the DCC ride control package that setups for standard settings, um, eco, sport, normal and individual uh, merely allow you to auto throttle response, uh, air conditioning efficiency, uh, steering feel and on the automatic models gear shift timings. Still even this is enough to change the character of your Golf SV to better suit the mood you're in and the road you're on. If you want to please your Volkswagen salesperson, then tell them this car looks like a Golf. That is, after all, just the point, given that the last thing the stylist wanted was the high-roofed toy town awkwardness of the old Golf Plus. Now, though this car is just as tall, its proportions are far more carefully considered with aesthetic tricks like a uh, glass house extending fifth side window and bonnet lengthening creases, preserving the smartly conservative look of Volkswagen's best-selling family hatch. 
As for the changes made to this revised model, well, the alterations can mostly be found here at the front, where this central lower grille has been redesigned. The forward-facing camera that previously sat in the middle of that is now more neatly located behind the Volkswagen badge in the center of the upper grille. Uh, for this brand logo, um, chrome strips flow out into revised headlamps that feature restyled LED uh, daytime lighting graphics. Full LED headlight beams are optional on most of the models in the range. And where front fog lights are fitted, you'll find that those have been restyled too. Talking of lighting changes, there's more of that at the rear where the tail light clusters now feature full LED technology right across the range. Uh, there's also a revised bumper design that more neatly integrates the tailpipe and these slim corner reflectors. Further up, this wide rear screen is capped off by this neat sleek roof spoiler. As for the profile, well here Volkswagen has largely left well alone, although of course there is an updated selection of alloy wheels. We have the 16 inch Toronto spec rims here. Otherwise, the confidently assertive Jim Tone silhouette is just as it was, complete with this strong character shoulder line that runs through the door handles and which culminates in those aerodynamically optimized two-part tail lamps. There's 4,338 millimeters of overall length, which makes this model 83 mils longer than a Golf hatch, but a significant 224 mils shorter than a Golf Estate. The important bit though, as ever, is the bit you can't see. In this case, the high-tech MQB modular transverse matrix chassis that when this model was originally designed, transformed the way that Volkswagen's developers could go about creating it. Uh, this SV's predecessor, the old Golf Plus, had to cope with the restrictions of exactly the same wheelbase as an ordinary sixth generation Golf hatch. That's thanks to a fixed floor plan that the Wolfsburg Spanner men couldn't tamper with. Uh, the seventh generation Golf models far more modern MQB underpinnings are very different and their flexibility enabled the wheelbase of this car to grow by 50 millimeters over that of the standard hatch counterpart. Now that has made all the difference both to the looks and to the practicality and space that you can expect once inside. Now, in analysing the interior, let's start with issues of luggage versatility, since that's probably one of the key things that a prospective MPV buyer is going to want to know about. Now, some of the motoring magazines have moaned that this SV doesn't have quite as much luggage space as some of its direct rivals, but that is a bit misleading because it's a comment that applies to a seats-folded total cargo configuration that you'll hardly ever use. So in terms of the standard boot, the thing you'll access every day, the capacity that this Volkswagen can offer is actually class leading, 590 litres with this neat sliding rear bench pushed right forward. That's 30% more than a Golf hatch can offer and only a fraction less than you'll get in the Golf Estate. Even if you need to use that bench for adults and activate the 180 millimetres of travel it offers going backwards, there's still 500 litres available. And that's virtually the same as you get in a Renault Scenic and a significant 68 litres more than you'll get in the Ford C-Max. It's decently shaped and a very usable cargo area too. Uh, there's a 12 volt socket and you also get an adjustable height boot floor that can be set to various heights, including one flush to the boot lip that's designed to be accessibly close to the ground. The flexibility continues once you've pushed the rear backrest forward. That's something that's possible to do in a 40-20-40 configuration. And that's very useful if all you want to do is poke long items like skis through from the boot. Uh, completion of that folding process though reveals disappointment, namely the lack of the kind of flexibility that you'll get at this point in a rival Scenic or C-Max, both of which allow the rear bench base to be tumbled forward and if necessary, uh, totally removed. If you've owned either of those two competitors, you may also notice the point we alluded to earlier, namely that the seats folded capacity you'll get from this Golf SV is less, the 1520 litre total figure around 15% less than you'll get in the C-Max and about 20% less than you could expect in the Scenic. If removal van ramifications matter to you, then that might be an issue. But we're guessing that for most potential family owners, it won't be. After all, how many Scenic or C-Max owners have ever taken out their rear seats or completely used all of the capacity their cars could offer?
very few we're getting. Now, what's important here is that the luggage area is quite sufficient for class competitiveness. It's 1,795 millimetres in total length. That's 35 mils more than the old Golf Plus could offer. And it's also beautifully trimmed. These neat flaps that smooth over the not quite flat floor area, they're a nice touch. Now, if you are occasionally likely to need to maximise carriage capacity, then do make sure that you order your SV with the optional fold forward front passenger seat, which is available with the mid-range SE trim level that most customers choose. That will significantly increase your potential total loading length to over 2.5 metres. So yes, that kayak, that bike or that surfboard will certainly fit. So on to the driving experience you'll get from a seat up front. You enter in through these wide opening doors and there's a low enough hit point to make getting comfortable easier for older owners. Once inside in proper MPV style, you do sit a little higher up here than you would in a golf hatch or estate, uh, the hip point being 59 millimetres higher in this model. Uh, we'd expect that the slightly more commanding view of the road ahead that this provides will be a significant SV selling point. Uh, once you've got used to that, uh, you'll be faced with a dashboard which is slightly different to the one that you'll get in the ordinary golf hatchback. The controls here are slightly less angled towards the driver, but you never really notice that difference and that's primarily because all the elements embedded into the fascia are exactly the same. This is of course no bad thing and the design with its soft touch finishes, its classy gloss black inlays and clear instruments that you view through this sculpted three spoke leather trimmed steering wheel remains class leading, certainly far nicer and more upmarket than you'll get in rival Ford or Renault. The quality of the materials used has been upgraded with this revised model and it's now even more difficult to fault them, complemented by build quality from the Vorsberg factory which is predictably solid, this being one of the relatively few compact Volkswagen models still actually built in Germany. Now true, you could say that this cabin lacks the high-tech ambiance of, say, a uh, rival Citroen C4 Picasso, but that's not to say it doesn't have its sophisticated touches. Take this big centre dash infotainment screen, for example. In earlier versions of this SV model, you only got an 8-inch monitor as big as this one if you pushed the boat out with one of the costly premium navigation packages. Now a display of this size is standard across the range, and it's upgraded here to the Discover Navigation System, which is fitted to the plusher variants and which is optional lower down the range. This touchscreen effectively deals with the usual DAB stereo, Bluetooth phone and car informational functions. And above entry level trim, it's embellished with Volkswagen's clever App Connect setup. Now this is the starting point for the brand's CarNet connectivity system and it's the key tool for bringing the best functions of your smartphone into your Golf SV via the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring systems. And once this software is activated, you're all set to enjoy things that you maybe never thought you'd be able to access on the move. Uh, for example, Apple CarPlay supports Spotify, the music streaming service, uh, as well as the video calling app Skype, and also Stitcher, which offers a variety of radio shows and podcasts. Android Auto works with a variety of apps too, including Instant Messenger's WhatsApp and Kick, and also Google Hangouts. Um, Volkswagen also adds to these with a further range of clever apps that you're free to download. Um, take the Media app, for example. That will allow rear-seated passengers to control in-car entertainment via their phones or tablets. Specify the upgraded Discover Navigation system we were talking about, and you also get a brilliantly helpful CarNet Guide and inform setup which gives you in-car online access to a whole range of useful journeying information everything from traffic news weather and news feeds to information on fuel and parking prices in your place of destination you can go further too thanks to a couple of optional extra cost technology features added into this revised Golf SV model. The option that Volkswagen has most heavily promoted is that for the replacing this center dash monitor with an even larger 9.2 inch Discover Navigation Pro setup. Now this incorporates a 64 gigabyte hard drive, DVD player and most significantly gesture control which for the first time in this segment allows common infotainment functions to be activated with just a twirl 
with your finger. Now we would think twice here, like other gesture control systems we've tried on luxury cars, this one is frustratingly inconsistent in its responses. Plus the expensive Pro setup lacks the rotary dials that are fitted to the lesser infotainment packages and it's just more awkward to use as a result. On the subject of ergonomics, uh, there's nothing much wrong with all-round visibility thanks to the big windows, the extra profile window in the rear C-pillar and that deep rear screen. Uh, as for practicality, well, yes, that's been well thought through too. There's this center armrest with its ratcheting top and integrated storage box. Plus you get the usual couple of cup holders here between the seats and there's also an elasticated strap alongside them. Uh, there is a storage bin integrated into the upper part of the dashboard. Uh, that is providing you don't order the optional Dyn Audio sound system though. Um, there is also a compartment down here by the driver's right knee and there's the uh, overhead cubby for your sunglasses. This area in front of the gear lever, that'll be absolutely ideal for your phone because that includes uh, USB 12 volt and aux in ports. And there are properly sized door bins and they're capable of holding a 1.5 litre bottle. And not quite so well shaped are the rather small under seat drawers which are fitted above entry level trim. And in the rear, well, it is true that an arrival Scenic, C-Max or C4 Picasso, he had the option of taking out the middle seat to free up more space for the two outer passengers. That's not an option with this Volkswagen, but then how often would you really want it to be? Of more significance for us is the fact that if you're a middle seat occupant back here, your legroom will be considerably inhibited by this prominent fixed transmission tunnel. And that's something that seems rather superfluous on what is, after all, a front wheel drive car. And this isn't helped by the fact that this SV is a little narrower than its rivals too. On the positive side though, most models get these useful fold-out seat back tables, plus there are door bins capable of taking one litre bottles and you get these little storage areas on each side between the seat base side and the door. Uh, there's a fold-down armrest here with twin cup holders, plus a central 12 volt socket so the kids can power up their games and a storage area around it for small items along with rear passenger vents. More importantly, headroom is good and it can be improved with the included seat reclining function. Likewise, your legroom can be suddenly enhanced to almost limousine levels by the fact that this rear bench can slide backwards and forwards uh, through a travel of 180 millimeters. It's lovely. As you might expect, this SV model is price positioned just above hatch and estate Golf derivatives, but not that far above. Uh, the premium you'll pay to get this variant's MPV versatility varies with trim and engine choice, but in rough terms, think of an SV as costing you 1,500 to 1,700 pounds more than a directly equivalent Golf hatch, and 750 to 1,000 pounds more than a directly equivalent Golf estate. For reference, an equivalent version of Volkswagen's Turan seven-seat MPV will cost around two and a half thousand pounds more. Overall, Golf SV pricing sits in the 20 to 30,000 pound bracket, which as we'll see is pretty much par for the course in the five seat family hatchback based segment of the MPV market. If this is what you want, then you'll find yourself choosing between four trim levels, S, SE, this SE navigation spec and the top GT versions. As for engines, well, let's talk you through those. Uh, things now kick off with the Volkswagen Group's well-regarded one litre TSI three-cylinder petrol unit in 85 PS guise with a five-speed manual gearbox. But can't imagine why anyone would ever buy that variant since for hardly any more, you can have yourself that one litre engine in far perkier 110 PS Form with a six-speed manual gearbox, a much wider choice of trim, and the extra cost option of a seven-speed DSG Auto if you want it. Now, here we're trying another petrol engine freshly added to the Golf SV range, the 1.5-litre TSI Evo unit, which is most widely offered in 130 PS form, and that's what we've got here. Uh, there's also a top auto-only 1.5-litre TSI Evo variant with 150 PS if you want it. As for the diesel options, well, there's a 1.6-litre TDI unit with 115 PS. That's available with five-speed manual or uh, as a seven-speed DSG auto. And an auto-only two-litre TDI variant 
variant with 150 PS. Now, where auto transmission is optional on an SV, it'll cost you around £1,400 more than the equivalent manual. So, how does this model's pricing stack up as the value proposition in the family hatch-based five-seat MPV segment? Well, as ever, it depends on your point of reference. Now, if that happens to be a compact people carrier like Fiat's 500L, well, you'll save around 20% over the cost of an SV, but then the Fiat is 25% smaller inside and it has a feebler range of engines. Uh, now, you could also make the same comment about Vauxhall's Mariva. No, you really need to compare uh, apples with apples or to get away from that analogy, this Volkswagen against the three segment market leaders that it was primarily designed to shape up against Ford C-Max, Citroen C4 Picasso and the Renault Scenic. Comparisons with this trio see this Volkswagen as actually being rather well priced. Uh, the 1 litre TSI 110 PS petrol variant that most will probably choose undercuts an equivalent C4 Picasso by around £500 and directly comparable versions of the C Max and the Scenic by nearly £1,000. This 1.5 litre TSI petrol version will save you around £800 over a much more feebly performing Renault Scenic TCE 130, although it is undercut slightly by the C4 Picasso in pure. 130 form. Mind you, that car is a bit slower. If you're looking at using black pump fuel, well, you'll find that the volume 1.6 litre TDI diesel Golf SV costs around about the same as its Renault and Citroen equivalents, but it undercuts the rival Ford C-Max 1.5 litre TDCI by around £500. If uh, price isn't so much of an issue and you'd like an alternative to this Volkswagen with the same kind of interior quality, then BMW's 2 Series Active Tourer and the Mercedes B-Class both might hold some interest. Um, a base petrol version of the BMW will cost you around £1,300 more than a Golf SV 1 litre TSI 110 PS, while a base diesel Active Tourer will cost around £2,500 more than a Golf SV 1.6 litre TDI. With a Mercedes, it's the other way around. A base petrol B-Class will cost you around £2,500 more than a Golf SV 1 litre TSI 110 PS and a base diesel B-Class will cost around £1,300 more than a Golf SV 1.6 TDI. You'll need to remember that both that Mercedes and the BMW suffer in practicality comparisons to this Volkswagen though they simply don't have the same level of boot space. That is also the case with the only two other direct segment competitors you could consider, uh, the Korean pair, Kia's Venga and Hyundai's iX20. Go for one of these two and you could quite conceivably save over £4,000 over equivalent versions of this Volkswagen, but inevitably you get what you don't pay for. Those two MPVs are now really quite old designs, which explains why, in comparison to a Golf SV, you'll have to put up with significantly higher running costs, higher depreciation, lower residual values, uh, a much cheaper feeling interior, and nothing like the same level of safety and media provision. So, unless all you really want is very basic A to B MPV motoring, these two are probably best avoided, unless your operating budget really is very tight. As usual in this segment, it all comes down to your personal preferences. If having looked carefully at all the other options, you conclude that it is this Volkswagen that you really want, then there are a few decisions to make. Now, firstly, how much do you prioritize driving dynamics? Well, if that's key for you, do you remember that only the pricier 1.5 litre petrol and 2 litre diesel variants get a proper high-tech multi-link suspension setup? All the other SV models have to make do with an old-tech torsion beam system, and that isn't quite as responsive and it can get a bit fidgety at lower speeds on poorer surfaces. You might also want to know that it's only those more powerful variants that can be ordered with the brand's excellent DCC, Dynamic Chassis Control System, that enables you to tweak the ride to suit the kind of driving you're doing. Now this adds an extra comfort mode to the driving mode selection system that's fitted to all but the entry-level trim SV variants. And now without DCC, the driving mode package can only alter the throttle and steering response and on the automatic models, the gear shift timing. Adding DCC to it properly completes the whole thing. Overall, what we're saying is that if you can afford either a 1.5 litre TSI or 2 litre TDR Golf SV variant, you'll get more driving experience options. But then we're guessing that most potential buyers won't really care very much about that. 
What we would probably advise against is opting for a model at the very top of the trim hierarchy. Now the flagship GT spec gives you unnecessarily stiff suspension that well, really doesn't suit the car and isn't really worth the extra money given that the lower trim levels really offer everything you really need. So let's analyze the equipment levels across the range. Even entry level S trim gives you a composition media infotainment system and that has an eight inch touchscreen, Bluetooth, an eight speaker DAB audio system, a CD player and USB SD card and aux in connection points. Uh, you also get roof rails, air conditioning and that also calls the glove box, a multifunction trip computer and a variable height boot floor. Most buyers though are going to want to try to stretch to one of the SE variants uh, if only to get a wider choice of engines and extra cost options. Uh, now you have to stretch to that level in the range to get a standard at least some of the elements of the advanced degree of media connectivity that Volkswagen is making so much of with this revised Golf SV model. Um, SE spec customers get the Carnet App Connect system which allows use of the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto MirrorLink systems. Uh, those enable you to mirror the display of your smartphone onto the center dash screen. And if you stretch to an SE navigation model, like the one that we're trying here, uh, you will get that setup upgraded to discover navigation status. And that includes a three year subscription to the useful Carnet Guide and Inform setup. With this, you'll get constantly updated journeying information on things like traffic flow, fuel prices, uh, weather forecasts and news reports. All SE models also get 16 inch alloy wheels, auto headlamps and wipers, adaptive cruise control, power folding mirrors, uh, front and rear parking sensors, front comfort seats with height and lumbar adjustment, um, an alarm, an auto dimming rear view mirror, an auto fold down lever in the rear seat backrest, seat back fold out tables and extra areas of interior storage. Plus there is the driving mode selection system and that'll let you tweak the steering, the throttle and on the DSG auto models gear change timings to suit the way that you want to drive. Now, if you want your Golf SV to have a sportier look, then the GT spec includes larger 17-inch alloy wheels, lowered sports suspension, front fog lights, special silver anodized roof rails, and rear privacy glass. Inside, a GT spec variant features sports seats with part velour trim, extra reading lights, carpet mats, and ambient lighting, along with a full Discover navigation system. On to options. Uh, if you've opted for base S trim, then you'll find that quite a few of the features uh, included at SE level can be ordered individually as options. And that includes the Discover navigation system that we've been trying here. And that can be ordered with or without voice activation. Um, once you have some sort of navigation setup fitted to your Golf, then you'll have the chance to use Volkswagen's media control app. And that allows passengers to control the media system using their smartphones or tablets. Now this app is freely downloadable and with it in place kids in the back for example can quickly find their favorite radio station and then equally quickly respond to bellowed adult commands to turn it down. If you have the funds to go further with infotainment on your Golf SV, then the optional feature that your salesperson will probably be most eager to talk about is Volkswagen's flagship Discover Navigation Pro media setup with its larger 9.2 inch color touchscreen. Now this introduces gesture control to this segment for the very first time and allows common functions to be activated with just a twirl of your finger. Plus the package also includes voice activation, a 64 gigabyte hard drive, a 3D mapping, a DVD player and of course the full suite of Carnet guide and inform functions I mentioned earlier. A further area of new optional cleverness with this car lies in what you can do with the headlamps. If you're looking at a mainstream model, uh, there's a chance to add in a high beam assist system, which will auto dip the beam at night or upgrade to full LED headlamps. That's a setup that on request can also include dynamic curve lighting that turns with the bends or dynamic light assist, which automatically adapts the beam to suit the conditions and the needs of other road users. 
And other options, well, let's start with the driving stuff. We've already mentioned DCC, Dynamic Chassis Control Adaptive Damping. Also worth considering is the Park Assist feature, and that can work either with or without an optional rear view camera. And either way, it can automatically steer the car into the tightest spaces, whether they're uh, parallel or perpendicular to the carriageway. Um, if you specified the optional swiveling tow bar, then you want this setup to come complete with uh, Volkswagen's brilliant trailer assist feature. Uh, with this, you can maneuver your Golf SV using the mirror adjustment switch as it steers itself to park whatever you're towing. Now, if we were regular towers, that feature alone might well sell us this car. Uh, other optional niceties include keyless entry, a wireless smartphone charger, climate control, a heated climate windscreen, a panoramic glass roof, front fog lamps, uh, power folding mirrors with puddle lights, rear privacy glass and a winter pack that will give you headlight washers and which can warm the windscreen washer jet so they'll work first time on frosty mornings. Uh, for the inside you might want a heated steering wheel and perhaps a more informative colour display for the centre of of the instrument binnacle. Uh, if you really want to spoil yourself, then you might want to tick the box for a full Vienna leather trim, or perhaps even the one for the Dynaudio Excite sound pack, and that'll give you a thumping 400 watt eight speaker sound system. Aesthetic touches include a range of alloy wheels with rims 15, 17 or 18 inches in size. Plus, remember that you'll almost certainly have to pay Volkswagen Extra for your preferred paint colour. The only one that comes as standard is the rather drab Urano Grey. Uh, as usual, there is the option of various metallic or pearl effect paint finishes. Uh, we've got the new cranberry red metallic shade here. If you want something more exclusive, then there is also a completely unique Oryx White Premium Signature colour. As for practicalities, well, we'd want to look at the usual mud flaps and carpet mats and the range of roof racks and carriers for things like bikes, skis and snowboards. On the SE models, there's the option to specify a fold flat front passenger seat so that the Golf can uh, accommodate really long items like surfboards. Uh, for the boot, you can get a useful luggage compartment tray or a luggage restraint net. On to safety, and this is an area where Volkswagen now claims class leadership with this model. Probably the most significant change to this revised Golf SV lies in its standard inclusion of the latest camera-driven safety technology, and the most significant feature being the brand's front assist autonomous braking system. Now, as you drive, this scans the road ahead, searching out potential accident hazards, warning you if one's detected, and automatically braking if necessary. Now, you get that same kind of functionality for slower Urban Motoring 2 as part of a city emergency braking setup, and that's included as part of the front assist package. All models also get predictive pedestrian protection, which specifically searches for pedestrians who might be about to step out in front of you, and if necessary, can initiate braking to avoid them. And there is also a clever automatic post-collision braking system, and that automatically brakes the car down to six miles an hour after a collision. So if, say, uh, someone hits you, and understandably you go to pieces, the car will automatically sort itself out. Plus, across the range, Golf SV buyers can expect to find a driver alert system, and that'll monitor drive room reactions for drowsiness and prompt you to stop for a restorative coffee if lethargy is detected. Uh, if you want more, then from SE spec upwards, an ACC, Adaptive Cruise Control System, comes as standard, and that's one of those that will automatically keep you a safe distance behind the vehicle in front on the highway. And from the SE spec trim level onwards, you also get a pre-crash preventative occupant protection system, and that senses when an impact's imminent and then braces the car to better withstand it by instantly closing the windows. In addition, it's worth mentioning that all Golf SVs fitted with navigation get traffic sign recognition and that pictures road signs as you pass them and displays them on the center dash screen. As for features fitted to all versions of this Volkswagen, well, you can tick off the usual twin front side and curtain airbags, plus a driver's knee bag. Um, rear side bags are optional. Also included across the range are features like Isofix child seat fastenings, a tyre pressure loss indicator, anti-whiplash uh, front head restraints, and if you're towing, a trailer stabilisation function to prevent dangerous trailer sway. On top of this, there are the usual electronic systems to try to ensure that none of these features are ever needed. That means 
ESC stability control, an ASR traction control system and an XDS electronic differential lock for improved traction and handling. Uh, there's ABS braking, of course. A hill hold assist feature stops you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions and panic stops will be advertised to following motorists by automatically activating hazard warning lights. If you want to go further with electronic safety provision, then we suggest you look at the possibility of paying extra for one of the optional lane assist packages that your dealer will be able to offer you. Uh, now, lane assist is there to automatically steer you back into lane if you drift from it. And this not only helps with long highway trips, but it also minimizes the risk that's posed by dangerous oncoming traffic on country roads. Oh, just how many lives could such a system have saved if it had been more widely available before now? The two headlamp technology options that we previously suggested you might want to consider. Uh, in either case, you'll be given the further opportunity to upgrade to a more advanced Lane Assist Plus pack, and that'll give you four additional features, emergency assist, rear traffic alert, side scan, and traffic jam assist. So let's finish by explaining those. Emergency Assist works with the adaptive cruise control system we mentioned earlier and on the move it senses if the driver has stopped operating the controls. Uh, perhaps he or she has been taken ill for example. Now if that's the case, uh, after a series of warnings the electronics will bring this Golf to a safe controlled stop with a slight steering swerve and flashing hazard warning lights to alert following motorists. Rear traffic alert will warn you of oncoming traffic when you're reversing out of a space. Side scan is a monitor that helps with lane changing blind spots, warning you if you're just about to pull out in front of another vehicle. Traffic jam assist, meanwhile, allows this Volkswagen to drive itself in low speed traffic queues at up to 37 miles an hour, and it uses the lane assist technology to help to keep the car in lane. It sounds futuristic, but if you have to regularly commute in stop and go traffic, this is a feature that you'll really come to depend on. There isn't much wrong with the efficiency side of the Golf SV proposition. Uh, now, this is one of the lighter contenders in the segment, and that's something that plays a big part in helping the volume 1 litre TSI 110 PS petrol model achieve class leading fuel and CO2 figures, specifically 56.5 mpg on the combined cycle and 113 grams per kilometre of CO2. For the 85 PS version of that three-cylinder engine, uh, the stats are 57.6 mpg and 112 grams per kilometer. If you're regularly going to be loading your Golf SV up with people or packages, though, uh, we'd argue that your real-world returns might actually be a little better if you were going to choose a slightly more powerful but still very efficient engine that might not have to be pushed along quite as hard. It's just such an engine we're trying here, the Volkswagen Group's impressive 1.5 litre TSI Evo unit. And this uses the brand's clever ACM, Active Cylinder Management Technology, and that cuts out two of its four cylinders under light to medium throttle loads. As a result, um, the efficiency stats that you get here aren't much different to those of the 1 litre model. Uh, in its 130 PS form, a Golf SV 1.5 litre TSI Evo manages 55.4 MP on the combined cycle and 116 grams per kilometer of CO2. There's no downside with any of the petrol variants if you opt for automatic transmission. Uh, for reference, the auto-only 150 PS version of the 1.5 litre engine records 54.3 mpg and 118 grams per kilometer. Having carefully considered all those figures, uh, you might conceivably decide that you don't really need a diesel. Uh, but those who still require one will want to know how the TDI versions of this car compare. Um, well, the base 1.6 litre TDI manages 67.3 mpg on the combined cycle and 110 grams per kilometre of CO2. Although with the optional DSG Auto gearbox fitted, you will do fractionally better than that. Uh, the top auto only 2 litre TDI 150 PS model that manages 61.4 mpg and 119 grams per kilometer. These TDI power plants, like most modern diesels, get a selective catalytic reduction filter to cut down on nitrous oxide, and the TDI system is these days designed around the injection of a urea-based solution called AdBlue into the exhaust gas stream to help clean up the emissions. Now that liquid is stored in a 12-litre tank mounted at the rear beneath the boot, and that will need topping up as part of regular servicing. 
So you've had the official stats, but with all the controversy in recent years over Volkswagen's quoted fuel figures, are they really achievable in day-to-day -day ownership? Well, we think a careful owner might be able to get close to them, but only if he or she were going to fully use all of the efficiency tools that this car makes available, and there are plenty of those. Um, as you'd expect, there is a gear change recommendation feature in the Instrument Binnacle's central display screen. And if you have a variant fitted with Volkswagen, Volkswagen's driving mode selection system, there's a selectable eco setting which focuses all the car systems on ultimate frugality. Uh, if you have a DSG automatic gearbox model, eco will activate a clever coasting feature at highway cruising speeds and that will disengage the gearbox from the powertrain, allowing the engine to idle until you next need it. That is just the start though. Across the range, the Center Dash infotainment screen includes a Think Blue trainer in its car section. And that's a display that gives you three circular dials that help with different areas of driving efficiency. Now the center one has two blue arcs in its outer ring and you have to stay within those by braking and accelerating carefully. If you do, you'll achieve a higher so-called blue driving score, and that's rated on a scale of 0 to 100 and shown in the left-hand circle, or graphically via a separately selectable blue score overview. Now, do well here, and the average fuel consumption figure shown in the right-hand circle will, of course, rise. Uh, and a touch of this round graphic will take you to a graph which shows your average fuel consumption over the last 30 minutes. There's also the option of accessing a series of Think Blue fuel saving tips, although to be honest, some of these are rather blindingly obvious. Things like think ahead when driving and uh, drive in the highest possible gear. Can you really be bothered with all this? Well, if you can't, there's no good complaining that the quoted running cost figures don't match those you actually achieve. The other cost-related facts surrounding this Volkswagen, though, are rather more straightforward. Uh, let's start with residual values. Now, those are higher than those of direct rivals, but they're still well down on what you get with a Golf hatch or one of the current breed of trendy SUVs that you could buy for similar money. Um, expect to get around 40% of your original purchase price back after three years of use. We should give you a feel for your potential insurance costings too. Uh, the base 1 litre TSI petrol model is rated at Group 70 in 85 PS form or Group 12V in 110 PS guise. The 1.5 litre TSI Evo 130 PS version we've been testing here is rated at either Group 15 or 16E depending on spec or Group 19E in its 150 PS guise. For a 115 PS 1.6 litre TDI diesel, you can group either 12E or 13E, depending on the trim level you select. And for the 2 litre TDI diesel, it's group 18E or 19E. As for servicing, well, as usual with Volkswagen models, there's a choice of either fixed or flexible maintenance packages. Uh, now, you'll choose the fixed approach if you cover less than 10,000 miles a year, and with this, the car will typically be looked at every 12 months. If your daily commute, however, is more than 25 miles and your Golf SV will regularly be driven on longer distance journeys, then you'll be able to work with the flexible regime, and that can see you traveling up to uh, 18 thousand miles between garage visits or every two years whichever is sooner and warranties well the standard package is three years and 60,000 miles we can't really see why Volkswagen can extend that mileage limit to a hundred thousand miles though since that's what's on offer with its mechanically very similar caddy model doing that though wouldn't give Volkswagen dealers quite so much of an opportunity to sell extended warranty packages though um, there is one for four years and 75,000 miles or if you plan to see a bit more of the world in your Golf SV there's a five-year 90,000 mile package. Whatever your decision, uh, the car will come with three years of pan-European roadside assistance and that has no mileage limit. The paintwork warranty lasts for three years and as you'd expect this model is protected by a 12-year anti-corrosion guarantee. Think you'd need a very good reason to buy a mid-sized MPV with fewer than seven seats? Well, we'd agree with you, but this improved Golf SV does indeed offer a whole series of very good reasons. 
The class, style and quality on offer here are certainly very tempting compensations for the absence of those extra chairs. And if you have decided you can do without the additional pews, uh, an SV certainly stacks up very well against the other potential five seat solutions that are available for families seeking more flexibility than an ordinary golf or focused family hatch can offer. Do you really want the mundanity of an estate or a converted van? Uh, the rather self-conscious funkiness of a Qashqai-style SUV crossover? Or the maternity unit practicality of a Scenic or a C-Max? Here is a slightly different way to go. A proper Golf that's also the proper people carrier that its Golf Plus predecessor never was. True, other five-seat MPVs can offer you slightly more seat-fumbling flexibility, but for many buyers, the incremental practical benefits these models deliver won't be that significant. Nor will these people care very much that this isn't the sharpest steer in the class. Ride and refinement, areas this Volkswagen is certainly strong in, are far greater priorities in this segment. Overall, this is a car that adds a dash of desirability to the business of owning what is, at the end of the day, nothing more than a practical family tool. I mean, in a sensible world, this is the kind of car that typical families would prefer over the fashionable frippery of an SUV. That won't happen, of course, but if a sensible world is the one you prefer to live in, then we can see how the prospect of Golf SV ownership might appeal. It makes sense, and it's a Golf. For quite a number of prospective buyers, that'll be all they need to know.